All right, well, thank you everyone for making it down today for uh, the Achievers Tech Talks. We uh, have been just getting started uh, to get the ball rolling again on our Tech Talks initiatives. This is the second Tech Talk of 2015, but we're super excited to uh, get the ball rolling again, and we thank everyone for taking the time to come out tonight. I actually realize I don't have a clicker. Do you have a clicker with you? Please, look at that. Um, so we're here to talk about accessibility. Uh, let me start off with a quick question. Out of everyone here, if one, on a scale from one to 10, if one is easy and 10 is very difficult, how hard do you think it is building accessibility into a web platform? So I'll start with one. Give me, a, give me a show of hands. One, and I'll keep going up. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. So a lot of people. <laughs> awesome. So the funny thing is, um, it's actually extremely, extremely hard. Getting accessibility built into a web platform is, uh, is uh, not an easy feat. Uh, if you could, don't mind going to the next slide, uh, Jason, not click yet. Um, so I'm not sure if uh, all of you are aware, but there's actually new legislation uh, that now requires all businesses to meet uh, requirement, uh, accessibility standards. And there are requirements right now that all businesses have to meet by certain dates. And there are a lot of requirements. So um, let's take a few seconds to look through all of these requirements that are outlined by this legislation. The orange ones are ones that are impacted by technology or they have to do with technology. And that's exactly the point. If we were to move this any slower, it would have taken us a lot longer. So there's a lot. Uh, and uh, we had to go through all that. Uh, we know that firsthand. And to walk us through the journey of what we had to go through at Achievers to build accessibility into our platform, I am excited to introduce our very own Jason Jang. Give him a big round of applause, please. Test, test. All right. Everybody hear me all right? Cool. Um, holding a beer. Um, uh, by raise of hands, who's a developer here? <laughs> who's a developer? Yeah. Okay, so mostly that. That's cool. That's perfect. Um, so, yeah, like Hytham, like Hytham said, um, I'm going to go through what we went through at Achievers and then there's going to be a few takeaways, too. So um, I'm going to start with my story, kind of my developer story, how I ended up here at Achievers. And then we're going to talk about uh, the important things to think about from an organization level. There's a lot of things to consider uh, before you actually get into the development part of it. And then uh, we're going to talk about, and then I'm going to dive into specific examples of, of rich UI that uh, we've made accessible here. Um, a little disclaimer. So sometimes, I find, at least personally, uh, the hardest part of learning a new language is learning the language around the language. So if you find that you, there's things in this presentation that, you, that you're not sure of, I'm going to be sharing the slides, and it's, uh, it's going to be linked heavily. So if there's anything you're not sure about, you'll be able to click through and kind of learn it. Um, hopefully, if you're not really understanding what's going on, it'll be a bit of a study guide for you. Um, right at the top, just some quick terminology. A11Y, if you didn't know, is a shorthand for accessibility. Um, that's because there's 11 letters between A and Y. Obviously, a developer came up with that. Um, component is a term I'm going to be using throughout. Uh, and in the context of this presentation, all that means is uh, a single part of an interface. So whether that's uh, a form element or uh, a slider or something like that. Um, and the term rich UI, I'm using as um, basically anything that isn't just content you read. All right, so let's get into it. So in the beginning. Um, I started making websites uh, just as a hobby. It's, it's kind of a career that found me. Um, then eventually became a side gig. And then uh, it became a part-time gig, and I worked full-time at agencies making static content sites for like Coca-Cola and Wonder Bread. 
uh, pretty underwhelming stuff. And then uh, I had a short stint um, as a freelancer getting heavily into debt. And that's how I ended up here at Achievers. <laughs> um, and Achievers has been a, a very different experience from any of my previous, previous gigs, if you will. Uh, it was at uh, marketing agencies where I was first tasked with making something accessible. And this is a term that uh, I, I wasn't even really sure what it meant. But what it comes down to uh, is that, you know, the Internet is arguably one of the greatest, greatest inventions of, of mankind. And truthfully, everyone uses it. And everyone should have the opportunity to use it as well. That's kind of the basic principle of accessibility. So when I was working at the agency, my boss came by and was like, hey, um, so that site you built for so-and-so, can we make it accessible? And I was like, what does that mean? He said, well, you know, like screen readers. And I was like, screen readers? What is that? People use screen readers. I didn't, this is the first time I'd ever, I'd ever uh, even encountered the term, and, I was, and so I had to do some investigation. But uh, at that time, for our clients, accessibility was simply a check mark, something they had to fulfill for the clients because they requested it. Um, not the ideal approach uh, with accessibility. I'll get into that a little bit later. At the time, the th kinds of things I was working on was just images and text. Um, and so it actually kind of made it, uh, the barriers weren't as high as it is with, uh, with the kind of stuff that we I'm working on today. Uh, and back then, it, it uh, didn't mean a lot of complexity. It was, it was some basic stuff, using semantic HTML and grid markup. I mean, that's good practice anyways, so you should already be there. But that means like using headings, lists, and links in their proper format, using your tags to their fullest potential. Um, and then there was landmark roles. So I don't know if you see this role attribute. Sometimes these things are, are baked. When you, when you download uh, WordPress vanilla from, from WordPress.org, you see that littered throughout. And I remember at the time, I didn't really know what they were. But they're landmark roles, and they provide context for screen readers that scan your page. Ever more important on pages like this, which is something that I worked on. And like I said, it's mostly text, images, pretty basic stuff. And so at that time, I came across a tool called the Wave Evaluation Tool. And this is a tool that you can still use today. It's still pretty useful. And it's a means to analyze your markup, and it'll tell you in a list exactly where your shortcomings are. There's a number of these tools. The Wave Accessibility Tool, A-Checker, and there's some JavaScript-based ones. Um, and at the time, these were perfect. And this is a way I could validate to my boss and to our clients that, yeah, our stuff was accessible. Oh, by the way, if any time you have any questions, just go ahead. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Oh, uh, cause, right. I want to, in the case of B and I and strong and M, they're just not explicit enough. Uh, B and I are used for, for appearance, the way the text looks. But strong and EM, which stands for emphasis, communicate more than just the appearance. It, it, it communicates this is more a piece of text that's more important than the other piece of text. Uh, likewise, like headings, like H1s, H2s, LI, they, uh, they provide extra information as to what the context of that information. So a piece of text that says, like, accessibility, by itself doesn't mean much, but if it's H1, accessibility means, oh, this whole page is about accessibility. So when it comes to semantic HTML, and again, that, that underline means that the links, you can click through, there's a whole page of documentation about that. Um, we practice pretty good semantic HTML here, too. Um, so this is back then. I could use the tools to validate my work. Uh, you fast forward five years, I started working at Achievers. This is a photo from Christmas, this is the whole company. Um, yeah, there's a lot of us. Um, and things were a bit different. So I'm just going to give you a quick demo of what we do at Achievers. So 
this is the welcome page to our platform. That has to do with my passwords. I keep using the same one. A very strong password rule. <coughs> my clue design. So, <laughs> Achievers uh, is a recognition platform, and so let's let's pretend that we all work here together. The idea is, is that um, you know, a workforce that thanks each other is a workforce that's more engaged, and, and thus a workforce that will be more productive. So at its core, our, our main feature is, is the recognition platform here. So if I scroll down, you got a news feed here. So pretty similar to that concept of the news feed on Facebook. And these are all recognitions that people, and Bree's been getting all kinds of recognition here, test recognition. Um, uh, and I can see who's recognizing who on the platform. I can put in my own two cents here and, you know, join the conversation. But ultimately what I'm going to do here is I'm going to recognize myself. I'm going to find myself here. And I brought it to the recognition page. And here I get to write a message to myself. Hey, hey, Jason, that talk was just okay. Try better next time. Um, and then down here, you pick a, you choose a, a core value that your company has decided that they want to instill in the workforce. So I'm going to say, uh, Jason Jang, thanks for living passionately. And I'm going to post it. And you see that these points get transferred to my account. Uh, the recognition comes up on the news feed, and then uh, <clears throat> at any time when you accumulate a certain number of points, you can go shopping, basically, and, uh, and collect the reward that you want with the points you've collected. So the main thing I wanted to show you is that this is not a static content website. It's not just text and images to take in. It's things you're interacting with. You hover, you click, you know, um, and so that was the biggest difference uh, from what I was working on five years ago. <clears throat> and at some point, Python was like, hey, can we make this accessible? So I sat there for a second. And I was like, okay, this website doesn't look like this. It's not just stuff you ingest. I can't use this tool because it's not going to tell me that my, my, my objects are, much of my interactive components are accessible or not. It'll just tell me that my markup is okay. I thought, okay, interfaces that look like this, like this, like this. Like, how do I make this accessible? Ultimately, I felt a little sad, and I was like, okay, I don't know if this is possible. How am I going to do this? Um, so I did a little research. I went to the library. That's what the library looks like. That's what made the library. And I, uh, I came across some very important documentation. Um, and ultimately, I decided, wow, ARIA really saves the day here. That's ARIA Stark, by the way. I've seen with them. Um, you must be thinking, why ARIA? Like, what is, how does that have to do with anything? It's actually, why ARIA? That's a really bad pun. But <clears throat> so why ARIA is probably one of the worst abbreviations I've had to deal with. Uh, it stands for Web Accessibility Initiative Accessible Rich Internet Application, which is an ironically inaccessible name to say over and over again. It's really tough. So I'm going to be referring it to as ARIA, or the Accessibility API. At its core, ARIA is a few things. But the biggest thing is, is this list of roles. If you remember a few slides back, I was saying, you know, you need to attach roles to certain elements to, to tell the screen reader where they are. The latest... Um, ARIA roles offer a lot more robust options when assigning tag, sorry, assigning attributes to your elements. Uh, and this came out only about maybe the last two years. And I thought, wow, accessibility, you've really changed. You've all grown up. <clears throat> and there's a few things that come with it. It supports rich interfaces. There's new roles, like that example there, div role button. There's uh, attributes for presentation changes. So this example here, uh, a screen reader would be able to tell that this button is pressed or not. And there's also um, support for asynchronous content. So when something changes 
do, to say, like an AJAX call, we can provide that feedback to a screen reader user. Now, those tools that I went over before are still useful uh, elsewhere, just not with rich components. It's only with static content those things will be useful. So, <clears throat> I thought, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, we, so we go back to IE8, but only with JAWS in particular. We have kind of like a very specific set of, uh, kind of a matrix, if you will, like IE8, 910 with JAWS, Firefox with NVDA. Um, it's not like, uh, uh, oh yeah, so JAWS is a, is a, is a pretty widely well-known screen reader. I'm going to get to that as well. But um, yeah, I go back to but IE8. Yeah, well, that's a whole other thing too, yeah. Um, browser support has been something that we have to deal with here. It's just, we kind of go with like what our clients need. And so it's always a little bit of a negotiation. We were trying to pair off IE8 support in general. But um, yeah, we can talk more about that. Um, so I was like, okay, we're all ready to go. Right? <laughs> but wait. When you're thinking about a, a platform as big as Achievers, there's a lot more to consider. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm just going to outline kind of the steps that we went through. These aren't necessarily the steps that you might go through for your organization, um, but th these are important things to, to think about, especially when you're dealing with, with an application uh, with as many users as we do, which is, is a thousand. So the next few slides, I'm just going to go over the, the, few things, the few steps we went through. <clears throat> Defining our users, um, uh, kind of deciding on what assistive technologies we would be exploring and supporting. Uh, taking stock of our code base and kind of assessing, it, are we ready to move forward with this? And then determining a rollout plan. When you have as many features as, as our platform does, you got to really start somewhere and focus on your core set of features. And then finally, that last question, how will you influence the paradigm shift, which I'll I'll get to in, in a few slides. So the first thing you gotta do is define your users. Now with any, I guess any UI challenge, this is something you have to do. You have to define what their needs are, but in our case, uh, their needs are very specific. <clears throat> uh, we have users who are vision impaired, which means they can't see the screen, or, and, sorry, vision impaired can have be any degree of Right? Varying degrees of vision, visual, visual impairment. So, I mean, they could be, you know, they could have 50% vision. And sure, they can kind of see the screen, but it means likely they can't see the cursor, which means the mouse isn't really an option. Um, likewise, uh, dexterity impaired means they, they can't use uh, uh, our typical input devices, keyboards and mouse. They might have something else entirely. There's things that, like armbands with three buttons, there's input devices with just kind of a trigger and a thumb, thumb button, stuff like that. And the hearing impaired, um, you know, if you have, if your application has auditory cues, like the way Facebook does, they're not going to receive those. How do you, how do you uh, support that? The next thing we had to do was investigate what kind of assistive technologies people are using. So the first row, JAWS, NVDA, VoiceOver, these are uh, the three more popular screen readers. JAWS is, in particular has been around quite a long time and has a really broad feature set. And it's kind of an intimidating piece of software to learn how to use. Um, I encourage if you do decide to take that up, uh, there's a lot of great YouTube um, articles, sorry, YouTube videos, and a lot of great support material. Um, but I would actually recommend trying NVDA or VoiceOver. They're much more, they have a lower kind of uh, barrier. Yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not, not on hand, but, um, I mean, we, we use um, kind of general stats to support our decisions. Uh, and, the, and what users we have talked to, it seems to be the trend that uh, the more modern users 
tend to shy away from JAWS just because it's expensive and it has a, a, a wide breadth of features that they might not need all of them. Uh, they tend to go lean towards like NVDA, uh, which has, uh, you know, supports a very narrow set, narrow set of needs. So it, t it tends to be a lot of the newer users, if you will, um, tend to shy away from JAWS. And uh, I don't blame them personally. It's, it's, a, it's a tough software to learn, to learn how to use. But uh, it also has a very wide, sorry, uh, they have a lot of users. There's a lot of people using JAWS as well. JAWS isn't only just a browser, it's your entire operating system. Um, so yeah, JAWS, NVDA, and VoiceOver are screen readers. I'm gonna give a demonstration with uh, VoiceOver shortly. And you can kind of get the experience. If you haven't heard, of, heard or used a screen reader, you'll get the experience of that in a second. Windows Eyes and Zoom Text are, are both softwares that help you zoom on a, a portion of your screen. Some people can't uh, or have only partial visual impairments, so you know, it'll zoom in like this. I, worked, I went to a recording studio once and I had a guy who had a monitor this big, but he worked this far away from the screen. So like, for someone like that, Windows Eyes and Zoom Text would be perfect. And again, um, there are users with specialized input devices. But you don't have to target um, every one of these pieces of software individually. It's a matter of using ARIA to its full, fullest potential so that you, would, you, you will inherently support the majority of these. So once we kind of figured out who our users were, what they were using, we had to look at our code base and, and uh, ask ourselves some questions. How is our markup? Uh, are we using H1s and H2s and H3s properly? Do we have um, landmark roles in our, around our content, that kind of thing. We also have to identify and address anti-patterns. An anti-pattern, um, I don't know if this is a real term, it's something I came across a few times. Uh, it's basically, it's a design, an interface design that may conflict with perceived conventions. And you, you might see this if you ever use a piece of software that you don't like using. And like, uh, I think RDO, they just went under. So RDO have an app, and there's so many things about that app that I was like, you know, I swipe left and something else would happen. You know, I swipe from the bottom and, and unexpected things would happen. And when you don't use conventions like that, um, so you don't use widely used conventions, especially in your web application, you're gonna run into hurdles when you go to try to tackle accessibility. So by addressing, and what I mean by addressing them is, sometimes uh, code isn't the solution. It's a matter of redesigning a feature or redesigning a particular interface so that we can make it accessible. And finally, we had to uh, break down our features into its components. Some of our features, as you saw, like it's a full page of stuff going on, but when you really look at it, it's like, oh, this is a form, this is um, a radio, radio button selection area, this is um, uh, you know, a button and so on. So if you could break it down that way, it's much easier to tackle. That's the wrong title. Number three is determine a rollout plan. So for us here, we had to, we, like I said, we have a lot of features. We had to decide what's the most important thing. And so when you look at your features, you're gonna have to take stock and, because really, you know, if you have limited developer resources, you're gonna have to start somewhere. So we ended up starting with the, that flow I just showed you, uh, the recognition flow, because that's our, our core business and that's the most important thing we, we have for our members. We also decided to tackle uh, global elements. Things like the, the nav, the top, and footers, and sidebars. If you tackle those at, uh, at the beginning, then you're covered for the rest of your pages if you, if you, if you have a kind of a template-based application. The last thing I wanna talk about was uh, trying to influence a paradigm shift in your organization. Because ultimately, accessibility is not a check mark that you check off and walk away from. Um, it's, a, it's gonna be ingrained in your processes. So it affects everyone in the, in, in the development life cycle. So how do you do that? Um, we did a lot, we did, I did a few talks like this. And so education's a big, a big, big first step. Your, dev, deve, your developers and your tester, testers need to know um, the ins and outs. And they also need to understand how to use screen readers. 
The designers need to understand accessibility because uh, they're the one putting your, they're designing your interfaces, absolutely. And finally, project ma managers need to know how to break the work down. They need to know uh, uh, how much time you need, for example. Uh, accessibility can get a little bit expensive, especially at the beginning. You'll find that your velocity will increase, but I think with testers especially, it can be especially difficult. And then we also uh, looked at uh, process improvement. Uh, I tried to find ways that I could avoid getting into, getting into pitfalls where like, we're at development, okay, I gotta make this accessible, and then I, and then I realized, oh, I can't because you know, there's an anti-pattern in here, or I can't make this accessible because I'm gonna be. So it's, um, it's good to vet designs before they get to the development stage. So I've involved myself with, with our product team and our designers to make sure that you know, things that get to the de development uh, develop to the development department have been embedded before they get there. And having a pattern or a component library becomes even more valuable. Um, we have a pattern library that we kind of maintain. And if you're able to update your components in one place, it's going to pay off big time. Finally, uh, I think I touched upon this already, but um, accessibility testing can be expensive. There is some automation possible. You can unit test a certain degree, but ultimately manual testing will be necessary for making sure that your, your especially your rich UI components are accessible. Okay, so with all things considered, we're gonna get into a little bit of a, a code demo. When you look at any piece of, uh, sorry, any UI, a rich UI component, there is two main facets to making them accessible. First is um, using ARIA for communicating roles, uh, presentation changes, and asynchronous content. So we're going we're gonna to give you examples for all this in a second. And then number two is making sure that um, every component is fully keyboard accessible. All right, so I'm going to do a little demo here. I've created a, um, basically I've created a, a simple page here. It's um, got a little form, got a even smaller, smaller form with, uh, when, I, when I submit a message here, has a little Robert indicate, okay, it sent the request to a server, it's gonna come back with a message. Um, the next piece is a slider, and the, the next is a tab. I'm gonna just try a little experiment here. I'm gonna turn off the projector. I have two versions of this page, one that doesn't have any accessibility in it, and another that is, has been uh, uh, fully made accessible. So I'm gonna turn off the projector. And um, you'll be able to hear my screen reader through the speakers. Voice over on Chrome. A journey to accessible UI components demo page window. A journey to accessible UI components demo page. HTML voice over off. So I'm going to show you. You're going to get glean two things out of this, I think. One, um, you don't really know what's on the page. And two, uh, this is going to be really difficult the first time you, you try to use a screen reader or try to even hear what they're saying. So you kind of saw what the page looked like a little bit in your head. I'm just going to go try to go through this page and see if we can glean the content off of this. Voice over on Chrome, a journey to accessible UI components demo page window, a journey to accessible UI components demo page, HTML content, heading level one, quick nav off, quick nav on. So on, on Mac, with voice over, you can press the left and right arrow at the same time and it turns something called quick nav on. Quick nav off, quick nav on. I toggled it. When you have quick nav on, I'm, I can use the up and down arrow keys to, to immediately jump to each heading. Heading level two, introduction. Heading level two, form accessibility. Heading level two, some Ajax call in live region alert. Heading level two, slider. You are currently on a heading level two, inside of HTML, intonation 71% to exit this web area, press control, muting. Volume 100%. Muting. Volume, pitch fit, rate 45, per, voice Alex, rate 30%, 35%. Sorry about that. All right, we're back. Heading level two, tab panel, last heading, heading level two, tab panel. You are currently on a heading level two, 
inside of HTML head, 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 head. first heading 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 level 2 introduction you are currently on a text element inside of HTML content heading level heading level 2 form accessibility voice over off basically I was trying to show that I couldn't read anything um, I'm going to try to go to the first form now voice of test at mailbox.com edit text test at mailbox to quick nab on Qu questions Collapsed pop-up button. You are edit text. Hi Dave. Hi Dave. Voice over off. Elements, but what it didn't tell you was it didn't tell you any of the labels. Voice over. Send a copy to yourself. Uncheck checkbox. Sub edit submit button. You are currently on the button the inside of HTML content. To click this. Right now I'm focused on the on the slider. Voice over off. Voice over on Chrome. A journey to accessible UI components demo page window. A journey to accessible UI components demo page. HTML content has keyboard focus. You are currently on HTML content. To enter the web area, voice over off. Trying to do presentations, proving voice over is really difficult. Voice over on Chrome. A journey to accessible link. TAB1, list four so items. You are currently on a link. T link. 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 TAB4, you are quick nab on end of link. T edge heading level Finally, one, accessibility, rich UI demo. You are currently on a heading level one, inside of HTML content, voice over so off. I'm going to show you the same page, but I've made it accessible. And you'll be able to, I'm going to leave the projector on this time. So you'll be able to see kind of where I'm scanning along the page. VoiceOver on Chrome, a heading level one, ex heading level, heading okay, level one, accessibility, you know, really rich scroll. UI demo. You are currently on a heading level, heading level two, heading level two, form accessibility, heading level two, some Ajax call in live region, heading level two, slider. So you are currently on a heading level two. Document. I'm going to go back to the top and go to the first paragraph. First accessibility. Heading level two, introduction. So we've got a page here, and we're going to take it piece by piece and make its components accessible. The skies are clear, but we're bound for a little turbulence. You are, I'm wondering if a screen reader can beatbox. Boots and cots and boots and cots and boots and cots and boots and cots and. You are currently on a tech heading level two. Give me all your information so, so I can do whatever form, I want with it. You are currently on a text uh, element. element. It'll read uh, each label out to me. Quick test at mailbox.com. Your email edit text. You are current questions. Reason for contacting. Collapsed pop-up button. You are message edit text. Hi Dave. You okay, are currently on a text here. voice over off. When you're building your forms. You want to be sure that you use um, regular old form elements. Sometimes you want to go to your way to try to customize your drop-down boxes to suit, to suit the look and feel of your UI. That's just going to be a barrier when it comes to accessibility because um, things like the drop-down box have keyboard support built into the operating system. So uh, those kinds of things you want, you want to leverage. I'll turn the voice over, uh, the screen reader back on. Voice over admiration menu item. You are send a copy submit button. You are quick heading level two heading level two slider heading level two some Ajax call in live region alert. You are some but message edit text. Hi Dave. Hi I'm Dave. Show you real quick. Voice here. over off. Um, I'll be able to. So when as a regular user, I can type a message here. I don't know why Dave is using a form to get messages, but and if I press submit, you get a little throbber. And eventually you get a little feedback saying, okay, your message was sent, no, not text me, but it, it should say, message sent successfully. Now, for a uh, user using a uh, screen reader. VoiceOver on Chrome, a journey to accessible UI can submit button main 15 items. You are currently processing the form. So processing the form was a piece of feedback I was allowed to. Message, so this is a voiceover off. Screen reader specific situations like that. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to, so I'm going to break down each of these uh, pieces of UI in the next few slides and give you some code samples as to what changed between those two versions.
So uh, I've got four examples here. The first one is form basics. So that you saw that form just now. And consider the following markup. Um, pretty straightforward. You got a label, your first input box, a label, a select box, and then another label and a text area. Now accessibility aside, this is missing some things already. You should always have uh, you should always associate your labels with your elements. So label for email and, then I, and, and its coinciding ID. This is not just good form practice, but also you're supporting accessibility by doing this. Because then uh, when the focus is in an element, the, the appropriate label is read. So that's pretty straightforward. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, that, that technique is also supported. Yeah. So what he was saying is uh, there's another technique where you can um, put your input just inside the label, wrap your label inside the, with, uh, sorry, wrap your label around the input. Um, and in my experience, the screen readers read that just the same. But it's always, no matter what interface it is, uh, accessible or not, uh, testing with real world parameters is probably a good idea. Um, so we saw this little form that had the, uh, you know, I type in a message, hit submit, a little throbber appears, and I get a little bit of feedback. So if you consider this markup, again, pretty simple form. You got a label, text area, the submit button. Um, I've got a throbber to indicate the Ajax, Ajax call, and it's got uh, a hidden class. Uh, the feedback which is a little green box that comes up. And down here I've got a live region. What makes it live is uh, these two attributes, role, alert. So there's, um, there's about five, I think five different roles in particular uh, with different contexts. There's a log, alert. So in this case I'm using alert. You can look those other ones up. But aria live, assertive means, if I choose assertive, there's assertive or polite. Assertive means Whatever your screen reader is saying, once this uh, is triggered, it'll interrupt you. And how this is triggered is all you do is you just change what's inside of there. Yep. Sorry, say that one more time. Yeah. Um, I've had certain browsers not support certain roles. So actually on our platform, I don't even use alert. I use, um, I think it's log, just because uh, a particular browser doesn't like um, alert. So it's, it's one of the toughest things with accessibility is um, there are no hard, fast rules and it's a lot of trial and error. So even, you know, I'm not gonna tell you guys that these are the hard, fast rules. This is just kind of my experience, you know. So if you consider uh, this markup, and hopefully you guys can read this. This is just a little JavaScript I scratched together. What it's saying is when this form is submitted, show the throbber. Pretend there's a message somewhere that shows the throbber. Um, and when the form gets submitted, you're going to get a response, and either it's going to be a success or an error. Now actually, this is accessible because alerts are accessible. Alerts are supported by your browser, supported by your OS. It's just not ideal UI. I don't think any, a, lot of, a lot of people use alert boxes anymore. So what you can do is, so I've got this little method, little method down here called update live region. All it did was change the HTML of that live, live region. So you know what? I'm going to just show you this in action. At the very bottom, I have my live region. And as you can see, it's got HTML in it. Just by modifying and yeah, modifying uh, the the the, mark, the string that's inside of this particular element will trigger your screen reader to, to project that uh, send that message to the screen reader. So I'm just going to refresh this page real quick. And you'll see when I press that submit button and I get the response, the HTML will, will get updated here. So 
try that again. Send it. So there's my first message, processing a form. So just by virtue of, of modifying that, you're able to provide feedback asynchronously to the user. Um, this is me going one extra step. Um, I'm not going to skip that one. All right. Um, so the third example was the slider. Now, consider, you know, you got, all you got is two divs, the wrapping outside one, and the handle, as you can see there. Now, this one is a, so this is the same piece of code that I've made accessible. There's a lot more information in, 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 the, in the form of attributes here. You got the role, the slider, aria of value min, value max, value now, value text. I'm going to show you the example one more time. And you can see, as I move the slider, those, at, those attributes get updated. So, um, let me just do this tab. The re and the reason you add those attributes to the handle itself is because that's where my focus is. So, when I move this with the keyboard, you'll be able to see value now changes. And so when I turn my screen reader on voice over on Chrome, a HTML co HTML content. Uh, VoiceOver doesn't like the development panel. It's kind of a pain in the butt sometimes. HTML co HTML content. Yeah, I know. TAB4 tab for quick nav on, quick nav off. Voice over off. Just like anything, if it is not working, just restart it. Voice over on Chrome. Tech, set, submit, edit, sub 250, slider, 300, 350, 400. So we have, uh, you'll notice that we have ARIA value now and ARIA value text. Uh, there is a bit of a discrepancy. If you want to format your value readout, like add currency or something, you can put it in, value, in area value text. Yes. Uh, define, oh, so that's within the... Um, so this particular slider, I'm using jQuery UI slider. Um, what's good about a lot of the jQuery UI uh, components is that they're keyboard accessible out of the box. So this particular one, I didn't even have to address the keyboard accessibility. All I had to address was uh, adding these ARIA roles. Uh, 50 is, is something I programmed in so when, I can, when, I built, when I built the slider. So, I mean, those things can be all dynamic, obviously, yeah. 450, 400, voice over off. So this is just like a, a snippet of, of what, of the code that initializes this slider. All I'm saying is, uh, when, the slide, when the slide event gets triggered, update these attributes. So, this is a really bad example because I'm hard coding these. These should be dynamic values, obviously. Scratch that together. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Um, you can take a few approaches with it. Um, for our platform, what I decided to do, and I'm, I'm still not sure if this is the correct way to do it, is I have one live region at the bottom of every page, and um, I created a JavaScript uh, method that, that's shared across all platforms that could say, provide this message any time, uh, from, a from any component, you know? So I've had one live region. There are other times where uh, if your UI um, has, a, has a lot of state changes happening, you might want one just for, just for, that, just for that particular component. Uh, it's kind of up to you. At least that, that's what my impression was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The last example are the tabs. So if you consider this markup, so it's just four links and then four panels of content. So we got four links at the top, 
four panels of content. And then, what are my highlights are showing up? Um, what you can see is, with each of the links, there's two things. There's the role tab, and ARIA selected, which communicates the state. Just like the same way that class equals current will change the look of your tab to be selected, ARIA selected is communicating to the screen reader that this one is selected. It's important to also understand that uh, your screen readers don't care about classes. Uh, they don't read them, they don't know even know they're there. They're there. So you got ARIA selected um, on the uh, whole, sorry, around all the links, you have role equals tab list on the second line there. And then finally we have tab panel. So for, for the whole tab component to work, there's three separate roles. The tab list, uh, tab, and tab panel. And with the tabs and tab panels, you have state as well. So I'm just gonna give you a quick demonstration. The screen reader will be able to tell um, as I go through the tabs which ones are enabled or not. Voice over on 4TAB1. Selected tab so one of four. Selected. You are currently on a tab. TAB two. Okay. Selected tab. Quick nav off. Quick nav off. TAB three. Selected tab three of four. You are currently on a tab three of four. To select voiceover I off. I added keyboard accessibility to this to let you use your arrow keys to go back left and right. But if I were to move my voiceover on Chrome. TAB one tab one of four. You are currently on a tab. One of four. To select this TAB4, selected tab, four of four. You are currently on a tab, four of four. To select this option, press control, option, space. Voice over off. So this is uh, just, I won't go through this, but a little bit JavaScript. Uh, Does anybody have any questions about the four examples I showed so, showed already? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's just a bad example. <laughs> yeah. With CSS, in that case, yeah. Um, generally, you, you don't want to capitalize text in your markup. You should do that. It, it, that's kind of a, a style thing. Yeah, that's what I said in my part for my example. Okay, so we're almost done here. Knowledge nuggets. If you can't find an ARIA role in the documentation that addresses your particular design pattern, there's a good chance it's not supported because it's an anti-pattern. Um, at that point, you might want to consider redesigning whatever component that is. Um, I encourage you, it's really easy uh, to just go online and, and, and kind of check it out. Um, I'm going to say tab panel as an example. You just tab. You know, what I tend to do is you can find an example. And you see the markup, and it's going to be exactly the kind of thing that I just showed you. You got tab list, got tab. So I just want to touch upon keyboard accessibility for a moment. You notice that when I was moving around the page, it would say quick nav on, quick nav off. Every screen reader, or most screen readers, have some sort of tool that lets you traverse the page easily. Um, and it's a very similar experience to using tab. If you ever use, like, I don't know, any Facebook and just tab it around if you're a big keyboard person. Uh, tab is kind of your, your go-to, but in the case of uh, an application like VoiceOver, you're provided with additional functionality to move around even easier. Uh, certain roles expect the use of arrow keys. So when you move focus on the middle stay, your screen reader will say, use the arrow keys to, to, to move around. And that's not copy you have to provide or anything, that comes from the screen reader. So that's something to be aware of. So when you're testing out certain roles, 
try a screen reader because it's going to say something to, to, your, to your user that you should really support. So if it says use the arrow keys, you should probably support the arrow keys. And if you're looking at an interface and you're not sure uh, kind of like how uh, you should be traversing through the interface with the screen reader, you can refer to your operating system. Your operating system, especially with voiceover, is in large part accessible. And so you, you can explore your, your, your operating system and see how they've tackled you know, certain patterns. Uh, get to know your tab index. Tab index, uh, there's three main values, zero, one, and negative one. You should never have tab index higher than, than one. You're gonna make things very difficult for yourself. Um, and that's something you should, guys should investigate on your own. I'm not gonna get into it right now. Uh, when you're supporting forms, uh, enter, sorry, uh, when you're supporting um, keyboard users, Enter and spacebar should both trigger links, generally speaking. Um, and in forms, uh, use the spacebar to activate uh, form elements, but enter should always submit the form. That's kind of a common convention anyway. The biggest hurdles we faced is definitely learning to use screen readers. Um, being able to test your accessibility will go a long way in understanding if it's accessible or not. Uh, and you know what? It's going to be an ongoing thing. I had a breakthrough like three days ago that kind of changed things for me. So I've had to have had to reassess some of our implementation. Deciding where to start. If you have a large application like ours, you're going to want to start everywhere, but you got to start somewhere. So you got to start somewhere. Testing is a big hurdle. Like I said, manual testing is, is very important for accessibility. So you got to figure out how to do that. I came across kind of some added benefits from embracing accessibility. One of them is, 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 is uh, improving your UI. Because you, it forces you to kind of scrutinize your decisions. Uh, when you have, uh, Achievers has been around for 10 years, is it 10 years? You know? We have code that's been around for 10 years, which means we have interfaces that have been around for 10 years. Uh, when, you, when you decide to uh, uh, kind of vet them for accessibility, you're gonna discover places in your platform like, oh, that was a poor design choice. So it forces you to kind of reassess. And it also presents an opportunity to fix them. Uh, a little food for thought. Create help for JS. So, yes, so um, there's a lot of classes. I'm going to show you one right now. So something like this. This particular class allows you to hide any element on your page from a sighted user, but lets a screen reader still read it. This is important in places like, you know, to a sighted user, it's obvious that this is a place to shop for things. But to a screen reader, it's not so obvious. So on a page like this, I would probably put an H1 up here that says, this is the catalog, and hide it using this particular class. You can't just use display none. When you use display none, it also hides it from the screen reader. So it's good to put these things uh, somewhere central so that everyone or every component can use the same class. So that's what I mean by uh, creating helpers. Uh, Uh, if you download these slides, I've linked to a really clever way to enforce accessibility into your uh, framework. Um, let's check that out. Before we finish, I just want to touch upon a few things. If you want your development organization to really embrace accessibility, it's not a check mark. It affects everyone. So you've got to really uh, assess your whole life cycle and, and determine 
where you can uh, avoid wasting time, basically. Catch the problems early on. You've got to consider everyone, users, testers, designers, developers. It affects everyone. Also remember, so with rich components, two main facets, you want to leverage ARIA to communicate with screen readers. You want to provide keyboard accessibility. I didn't touch upon the, the keyboard accessibility part of it too, too in depth today. I mean, that's something you can Google yourself. But like I said, there are uh, component libraries out there that support keyboard out of the box. So it might not, be, have to something, might not have to be something you really get into. All right, finally, uh, special thanks to um, Chris Gurney and Avi, who are uh, respectively the project managers and, de and developer who worked on this with me. Um, it's a lot easier when you have people to work with, especially uh, when you got so many questions as I did. And that's it. Thanks for uh, sitting. We'll be providing the slides and video uh, on our Meetup channel. Uh, we do have several openings. We're hiring, so um, talk to Hyphen. He's the one with the crutches. Uh, and you can reach out, to, reach out to us. Any of these links? Oh yeah, question. Oh yeah, uh, we haven't had to deal with that to be honest. I haven't really had to deal with that that sound. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I don't know. It, it, so you mean dragging, dropping things into other things? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I wonder how uh, Jaws performs in Photoshop. That might be a place to kind of reference it, or even just looking into how applications like Photoshop support the keyboard. I imagine drag and drop. I mean, generally speaking, only uh, is a redundant way to like add a file to something. So there must be another flow for adding a file. Um, I think we have one uh, interface on our platform where like you can attach an image to something, and there's a drop area you can drag an image in. But there's also a button to open the file, which opens the file dialog, which uh, is inherently support uh, accessible in your operating system. So, I mean, there's, there's going to be times where you'll just have to provide another way for, the, for, for that particular user. Okay. Yeah, that's something we're still working through. We haven't, we're testing, uh, I mean, this is still kind of a young project. And so ideally, you want real world users. You want people, people with visual impairments, dexterity impairments actually testing. From what I understand, you can reach out. There's uh, organizations in Toronto that you can either visit or you can hire people to test software. And you know what? That community is super keen on getting involved with anybody who wants to support them. Um, and so I, I um, you, you can probably reach out. There's uh, Accessibility Toronto, LITO. Uh, they're, they're, they're a great organization. And, uh, I think they'd be willing to be in contact with people. I talked to like just random users, and they're like, "Yeah, I'll come down." I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I'm gonna pick you up or something. Right? Cool. Yep. Um, yeah. Actually, I had a kind of revelation three days ago. I found myself adding tab index to things uh, that I shouldn't be adding tab index to. Uh, in my mind, just tabbing through a page is, is what they did. Um, but, you know, if you have a page of content, just, you know, p tags. You shouldn't be adding type indexes to p tags, but that was my, my implementation. I told my tester that's good, so that was definitely a false positive. But, you know, uh, as I got to understand how a screen reader works, you know, you shouldn't be adding type indexes to just.
just about everything just because you want to be read by the screen reader. You, you know, screen readers provide features for you to skim across, across your content. Um, I would say that's probably the most recent false positive that, that I have seen. Um, yeah, yeah, true. So we had a visit with a client and uh, they had a, a representative who uh, was blind from birth, I think, and he used JAWS maybe faster than I use my eyes. Like, he was flying around the screen, you know? Um, and that was just using the arrow keys, not using tabs or anything. So I, I walked away from that meeting, and I was like, I don't even know how to support that kind of user. But as long as you stick to the basics, you know, providing, uh, providing the right landmark roles, using proper markup, um, there is a little bit, you know, I, for us at this stage, there's a little bit of assumption that, you know, uh, as long as you implement it right, it should be supported. But we're kind of still in negotiation about how are we going to uh, validate our work. And that's the next question. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, um, one of the big roles there is a role application. So role equals application versus role equals document communicates to the user that this is a, you know, role equals document means this is a, just content, you can read it. Whereas role equals application means uh, this has things you interact with. Um, on our platform, because of the number of widgets we have, I kind of decided, oh, I'm just gonna wrap this whole thing in an application. And all the documentation says these you know, be, be he you know, hesitate, sorry. Basically said, don't do that unless you're absolutely sure that this is the best way to do this. Uh, and it really bothered him. So uh, the, the particular user we're talking about is like, I don't know why he keeps trying to do this. And like, oh, I know why. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's one in particular that uh, I'm still not 100% sure what the best way is. And the documentation isn't even like hard and fast. It's like, you know, Kind of assess. Is your thing mostly an application? You know, so it's like it's kind of a judgment call. Yeah. 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 Um, well, for, for Yeah, she was asking like, uh, how, basically, how do we test? Like, if, if you know, if you don't have any impaired users in, in, in our company, how are we testing it? Our particular tester, we just we train them with JAWS, and there's certain expectations with the interfaces as, as far as what they should hear with each one. So it was a matter of educating our tester, you know, how to use JAWS or how to use NVDA, and uh, you know, I write acceptance criteria saying when you, you know, when you navigate through this in this manner, this is these are the things you should hear. It should tell you the label. It should tell you the state, and so. On. So, I mean, you can go as far as rating that acceptance criteria, but as far as accessibility, usability, that's the whole other thing where you really need, need real-world testers, you know? Regular, you know, uh, study or non-impaired users, non-impaired testers are fine to support your acceptance criteria, but not for your usability. What we ended up doing was, uh, so our platform is uh, instance-based. So each client has their own instance, and each is configured with the colors for the platform. So our platform looks like that, purple and red, but you know, various clients have different uh, colors. Uh, our product manager basically vetted through those style sheets and was like, making sure that the ratios uh, 
clear um, you know, set the level. What he's talking about is, uh, you know, some people are colorblind, so you can't have, sorry, you have to have a, at least a certain amount of contrast in your text, in your background colors. And this can be analyzed with certain, you, know, you can go to an online tool and put the two colors in, and they'll be, give you a contrast ratio. I think 1.71 is the minimum for, Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, when we uh, investigated that in our particular case, it, it was fortunately pretty much a non-issue. It's tough. One thing we're not even sure of is how many of our users are using our accessibility features, uh, because I, I don't even, I'm not really sure. I haven't even touched upon analytics for accessibility yet. You know, so it's one of those things that. Finding your users all the more difficult. Agreed, yeah. Um, I would say if it's, if it's if you're building like a modern application, I don't know. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough to say. Like if you're a startup, you're probably not going to be spending money on that. But it's not that hard to bake it into your components. Like if you're designing components, uh, or rather building application component by component, it's a lot easier to tackle those things piece by piece. Um, and that way, you know, as you initialize them or use them, you know, every instance will just be, be accessible as well. I think, um, you know, especially in the context of our, our platform, if I was sitting there like, oh, we're building a new recognition platform, you know, straight from scratch, then yeah, let's do it right, right from the beginning. Make, make everything accessible. But it's a lot harder to go back and, and make it accessible because you have to uh, live with your decisions, your design decisions. I mean, I would say it started as early as your design phase, uh, you know, setting all your designs. Yeah. Yeah. I find I find like the, the base of it kind of comes with being a good a decent developer. Like if you're writing clean, good markup, you're halfway there, especially with form stuff. And I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, text them in. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that right? Wow. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and I, 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 I would bet that that user might have tried to reach out to the NBA first, but had no accessible way of doing that, you know? And I'll show you something, like, uh, totally. Um, on LinkedIn, so one of the, um, if you recall, Hytham had a slide where it showed all the legislations kind of crawling by. One of them said, you have to provide an accessible way for an impaired user to provide feedback about your accessibility experience. In LinkedIn, they have something baked in where you see this kind of jump menu that appeared as I tabbed into the page. It's the first thing that you tab into, let's refresh the page to show you again. You tab into, oh, I can't see the here. Oh, maybe, yeah, all right. So it shows a little jump menu, but it's got, you know, accessibility feedback. All that is is a, a link to an email. But that, you know, that little bit of code provides a lot of compliance and it would probably avoid something like what happens in the NBA. Any other questions? Ooh, whoa, whoa, okay. All right. Thanks, everybody.